welcome to the Be About Being Better podcast, where we help people make evidence-based, sustainable, small changes for their health that compounded the huge shifts towards a better, more vibrant life. I'm your host, Abby Stacier, a health and life coach, future registered dietitian, a master's graduate from Columbia University, and a certified intuitive eating counselor. And I believe that we can't make lasting or meaningful change single-handedly. So I'm so happy that you're here so that together you can see that a diet-free, sustainable lifestyle is possible and you can leverage that to live a better life. And remember my disclaimer, this podcast is meant to give you general information and it's not meant to substitute or replace medical advice, a diagnosis or service treatment. Hey y'all, welcome back to the podcast. Super excited to have you here. Today we're gonna be talking about nutrition for your cycle, your menstrual cycle, your period. And your period, your cycle, Hey y'all, welcome back to the Be About Being Better podcast. Super excited for today's topic. Today, we are talking about nutrition for your menstrual cycle, nutrition for your period. And I wanna first dismantle a myth because a lot of people believe that their period consists of just the time that they're actually bleeding, when they're quote unquote on their period. But we're not just on our period or off our period. The menstrual cycle is comprised of four distinct phases that last about 28 days on average. Some cycles are shorter, some are a little bit longer, but on average, it's about 28 days. And there are so many hormones involved in our menstrual cycle. And over the course of those about 28 days, our hormones change at, (coughs) our hormones change by 25%, which is very significant. Small changes in our hormones and fluctuations can make a huge difference. So it just makes sense that over the course of the 28 days, we're gonna notice changes in our mood, changes in our metabolism, our digestion, our skin, our energy levels, our sleep quality, our libido, our creativeness, our motivation, so many different things because our hormones are changing and our hormones govern and dictate so many different things about our physiology. So it doesn't make sense that we'd be eating the same way and exercising the same way and doing the same self-care and everything the same day in and day out when our body is not the same week to week throughout the month. Our body is actually significantly different week to week. So it makes sense to be slightly altering how we eat, how we exercise, how we cater our lifestyle depending on what our hormones are doing that week. And we should be changing slightly what we're doing so that we're actually supporting our hormones during this time. And actually a lot of the adverse period symptoms that you might be experiencing, whether that be irregular periods, heavy flow, nausea, vomiting, like very severe cramps, cystic acne, you know, those are just some, you know, some to name a few, but you might also have diagnosed conditions like PCOS or PMDD or um, endometriosis in, you know, who you are, most likely if you're listening to this, if you fall into that category. So, you know, you might be having some of these adverse period symptoms thinking that they're normal when really it's a product of a hormonal imbalance and making these tweaks when today we're just going to talk about the nutrition considerations, but there's things that you can change. And we'll talk about these in future episodes about your exercise and your self-care routines to cater to and go with the grain of your menstrual cycle. So that you're really aligning your life with your hormone fluctuations. But if something is off with your nutrition or your lifestyle, it might be going against the grain of what your hormones naturally want to do. And it's causing these adverse period symptoms because those things aren't normal like yes when we're on our period uh, we're shedding the uterine lining right like it it is an uncomfortable experience what our body is doing although it's a very natural experience it's it's uncomfortable but it shouldn't be so severe where 
you're taking days off from work and you're just writhing in pain and um, and things are just so horribly painful that you can't, it's affecting your daily life and, and your daily living. And I know so many people are out there just dealing with that and are just told to take Midol and suck it up and throw a heating pad on it and, you know, throw some dirt on it and just, you know, get back out there in the game. And it's like, no, like we shouldn't be suppressing these symptoms because they're not normal. We need to be you know, looking to food as as medicine and figuring out what can we change in our lifestyle in a very easy and natural way that like, what could we be doing that's within our control to cater to our hormones and not have a lifestyle that's really going against the grain of what our hormones naturally want to be doing. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And definitely look out for future episodes because we will be talking about the exercise considerations and the self-care considerations. Today, we're just going to focus on nutrition. There's a few things that I want to note before we really dive in into each of the four phases and what specifically should be your thoughts when it's coming to nutri when it, you know, in terms of nutrition for each phase. But before I dive into that, I, I want to say that our period health is our fifth vital sign, meaning that it's just as important as our blood pressure. And it's just as important as our blood pressure in terms of how it's a marker for how our body is functioning. It's a marker for are we like healthy or not? Like is something off or are things functioning well? So if you have very adverse period symptoms or you're not having a period, we might be thinking in society like, oh yeah, I don't have to deal with that this month. But in your head, you should be thinking, oh no, something is actually off. And I got very into period health and learning how to align my lifestyle to my cycle uh, because I was on birth control for years and I was on a pill that was specifically made to make me have a period. Now I know when you're on a form of synthetic birth control and you have a period, it's more like breakthrough bleeding. It's not actually a period, but neither here nor there, you know, quote unquote period that I was having when I was, you know, on birth control, I actually stopped having that. So I was on a pill that was supposed to make me have a quote unquote period and I wasn't getting that. So I'm like, oh, what's going on here? Like something is definitely wrong. So I weaned myself off of it and I, you know, started diving into research and I discovered Elisa Vitti's work. She is the founder of Flow Living and she is the founder and creator of the cycle syncing method which is you know what we're going to be talking about today i mean her book woman code it was absolutely fabulous in that she has two books woman code and in the flow her first book woman code talks about her story with pcos and she had cystic acne she you know within a bmi range of, you know she was um, d definitely someone that was in a larger body and more in the you know, overweight, obese range on the BMI scale, which there's so many issues with BMI, but we'll get into that in future episodes too. Um, but when she went to the doctors, you know, she, or she wasn't getting a period or it was very irregular. She had cystic acne. She, you know, was, was overweight on, a, you know, the BMI scale, which there are so many issues with the BMI scale, but we'll get into that into other, you know, in other episodes. But she, um, you know, went to the doctor and was like, you know, what's going on with me? And they diagnosed her with PCOS and they basically said, this is a death sentence. You're going to get ovarian cancer. You are going to need to be on diabetes medication for the rest of your life. Like this, you, you are infertile. You're not going to be able to have a family. Like this is basically a death sentence being diagnosed with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. What? she ended up not taking any of the medications that they recommended and she walked out of the office she was a you know college student at Johns Hopkins University at the time and she dove into research instead and she started being her own patient trying things out to heal herself naturally without pharmaceuticals what could she change when it comes to nutrition and exercise and lifestyle to realign her hormones and she ended up going back in for a scan, you know, so many, so much time later. And after she figured all this out and she 
did not have any more cysts on her ovaries. She literally cured her PCOS. Absolutely incredible. And she's helped so many, you know, other, other people do the same with her cycle syncing method and her company Flow Living. And her new book, In the Flow, talks more about the updated literature and really the updated conversation of birth control and and more of an applicable way to incorporate her cycle syncing principles into your life. So I love the conversations that, the, that she has and that she brings up in that book. Um, so if you don't have PCOS, PMDD, endometriosis, I would definitely recommend her book, In the Flow. If you do have any of those, you know, diagnoses, I would recommend reading her book, Woman Code. I think, you know, both of her books are absolutely fabulous. And um, so that's what really got me interested in, in period health. And by following these nutrition considerations, as well as the other lifestyle ones, I was able to, when I got myself off of birth control, get my period back in in two months which is really in a regular way like that's almost unheard of most people are waiting six to nine months to be regular and when i got my first period after being on birth control for so many years it really wasn't that bad you hear these horror stories of people having like the worst most painful periods when they haven't for so long and their ovulation has been suppressed for so many years or a decade but it really wasn't that bad for me because my lifestyle was supporting the natural fluctuations of my hormones. So today from a nutrition standpoint, we're gonna talk about how, how to do that. And you know, I wanna make a disclaimer that y'all know that I am you know, working to be a non-diet dietitian. I definitely help my clients cultivate a non-diet approach and get away from diet culture. So as you're listening to this, I do not want you to treat this like a diet. This is not a diet. And I'm going to be talking about some specific foods that you could eat to support your hormones and why at different points in your cycle. But I don't want you to take that as gospel in the sense that these are the only foods that you can eat. And you'll see in the show notes that I have a free guide that gives you a fuller list of foods that can support your hormones at each phase. We'll just talk about a few, but definitely download the free guide for a fuller list. But I just want you to know, like, if I give you the foods for ovulation phase, those aren't the only foods that you can eat. That is just a list of here are the foods that have been shown to support your hormones best during this time. And pick a few of, you know, you probably have the foods that you normally like. See which ones on that list for each phase. You Like, maybe pick three to five foods to loop in at that time of the month that you like into your normal routine. Those aren't the only foods that you can eat. And you know, diet culture wants you to believe that, okay, you can eat this and you can't eat that. It's like, no, you can eat any food anytime. Here are just a few foods that you might want to weave in to your routine at different times of the month to support the natural fluctuations of your hormones. I hope that that makes sense. And I, I really don't want people to treat this like a diet. And I find that it's easy to do that and get confused if you are still very much immersed in diet culture. And if you don't already have a routine for meal prepping and a routine for grocery shopping routinely and a strategy for meal planning and just a routine for healthy habits. This is something I work on with clients all the time is before we dive into aligning your lifestyle according to your menstrual cycle, whoa, 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 we're first working on, uh, like, are you eating regularly? Are you still skipping meals? Are you eating enough? Are you in the habit of grocery shopping, meal planning, and meal prepping? Like, we need to get, the, are, like, are you in the habit of drinking enough water, right? Are, are you avoiding carbs or restricting in any way? It's like, we need to get these very foundational things handled first before we can start aligning our our foods to our cycle or else it's not going to be sustainable and you will be more susceptible to treating this like a diet. So just keep that in mind that if you're thinking to yourself like, okay, I don't have the best nutrition habits right now, consider taking our quiz and getting some personalized support around this because nutrition needs to be so individualized and you might need some accountability and guidance to help you weave through the nutrition confusion that's out there so that you know what's best to eat for you and your body and your schedule to get to your goals. And then we can work on the menstrual cycle stuff. 
So I just wanted to, you know, make that a disclaimer in the beginning of all of this that we don't want to treat this like a diet. And um, you may also benefit you. I'll link this up in the show notes. Our uh, my meal, my free meal plan and prep guide. If you aren't in the habit of meal prepping or planning, I go over my Be About Being Better method for meal planning and prepping in that free guide. So definitely download that as well. We'll link that up in the show notes. So let's dive into this, y'all. So there are four phases of the menstrual cycle. The first phase that we'll talk about is follicular phase. Follicular phase starts the day after you are done bleeding. So once the, that is menstrual phase, when you are actually bleeding. So once you're done bleeding and you're done with your quote unquote period, like there's the whole thing's your period, but the, the actual bleeding portion, then you start follicular phase. Follicular phase lasts about seven to 10 days. And each of the four phases is commonly compared to a season. So this is our spring. Think about how you naturally feel after your period's done. It's like a cloud is lifted. Like, oh my God, I feel like a new person. You feel reborn. You f Even if you're naturally an introverted person, you're like ready to socialize. You're ready to be more extroverted and social. You just naturally have more energy and confidence during this time. And you feel like a cloud has lifted. Like cognitively, you just feel sharper. Energetically, you just feel like you're in a higher vibe. So... It's also important to note that during this phase, your metabolism, even though you're feeling revved up and more energized, your metabolism has decreased a bit. So you can handle a slight caloric deficit better at this time. And this is normally when people start a new health kick. So it's no surprise that when people are in a caloric deficit and starting a new meal plan or, or diet, whatever it is, that they, their body responds well to it. Our body wants lighter foods during this time. So like salads and chicken, like we, our body responds well to that. We digest raw vegetables pretty well at this time. We want light foods. We want the poultry. We want citrus. It's a great time to put lemon in your water and we don't need as many calories during this time. So that's why our body responds well to a caloric deficit because your body is like, you still need to be eating enough, but obviously, you know, your metabolism is a little bit slower. Like you don't need as much. And we'll see in other phases and I'll talk about which ones that's where you need to be eating a little bit more. So those light foods sit like I always put lemon in my water during this time. I definitely make lemon pepper chicken, rice and broccoli. I have a lot of salads during this time, turkey meatballs, great time for avocado toast with an egg on top. Normally have that for breakfast. It's a really, really great time for that. The next phase is ovulation phase. This is our fertile window. It only lasts about three to four days. And most people are surprised to hear that they are only fertile for those three to four days. Obviously give yourself a buffer because not every cycle is regular. Some people are a little bit longer. So definitely, as far as fertile window goes, definitely give yourself a, a bit of a buffer. In this phase, switching from follicular to ovulation, your estrogen level is increasing. It's reaching a peak because it needs that in case uh, you're fertilizing the egg, right? So in, at this time, this, is, this ovulation phase is equivalent to our summer season. So think about the natural progression from spring to summer. Energy is even more increased. You're even more social. You're traveling, you're out and about. Even if you're an introverted person, you're normally doing more social things in the summer. You're feeling in a high vibe. That's just how summer is. And that's how ovulation phase is. And because this is our fertile window, biologically, we are very attractive and we have this more magnetic pull with the opposite sex. So libido is up during this time. Um, your attractiveness is there and you're just feeling more naturally extroverted and, and social during this time. Now, because our bodies are, they can also take a lot during ovulation phase. So it's actually the best time to have more endocrine disruptors or hormone disrupting substances like caffeine, alcohol, obviously be careful with alcohol with uh, this being the fertile window, a skirt, and, you know, processed foods during this time, um, 
endocrine disruptors can also be things like perfumes. Um, so our body handles these things and breaks them down a little bit better during this time. So it's a better time to have these things. In addition to raw vegetables, like normally we don't digest raw vegetables super, super well. It, it's very taxing on the system. It's not that vegetables are bad to have, but you know, it's just a little bit easier if like you put spinach in a smoothie and it's already pre-digested or you're steaming, sauteing, roasting foods, right? Like it's just a little bit easier to digest, a little bit easier on the, the system. So we still want to keep foods light. So we, we want to steam foods. We want to saute foods. It, we can have, you know, raw vegetables at this time. We still want to keep up with the citrus. And then, like I said, we can handle those endocrine disruptors a little bit better. So this is a relatively better time to have alcohol and caffeine, processed foods, things like that. Next, we get into luteal phase. Luteal phase is about 10 to 14 days. It is our longest phase. And luteal phase is a little bit, it's a little bit moody. It's a little bit complicated. There's a lot of things going on because it is so long. Now, in ovulation phase, I mentioned that estrogen is increasing and it's reaching a peak. What goes up must come down. So in luteal phase, the beginning of it, estrogen is decreasing and progesterone, another hormone involved in your cycle, is starting to increase. So your, your hormones are changing. So naturally, things are going to shift biologically. Your metabolism is going to change. Your mood is going to change. Your energy levels are going to change. Your creativity and it just, you know, your wants and desires are going to change at this time because you're really having a drastic shift in your hormones. Now, the beginning of luteal phase kind of mimics follicular phase because if you're looking at the peak of ovulation, uh, the peak of estrogen at ovulation, you know, as it's as estrogen is increasing in ovulation, it reaches the uh, no, sorry. Let's go back. As estrogen is increasing in follicular phase, it reaches that peak in ovulation, it then starts to decrease at the beginning of luteal phase. So the beginning of luteal phase is very similar to follicular phase. So you probably still can handle a lot of the same foods, but after you're done ovulating, like after the first two weeks after your last period, you definitely want to start, even if you don't feel it yet, you want to start switching to the nutrition considerations for luteal phase and kind of start to get away from the follicular and ovulation because your body is starting to shift during luteal phase and then menstrual phase comes after this. So for this half of the cycle, follicular and ovulation and luteal and menstrual phase are frequently linked together as two halves, even though there are four distinct phases. So luteal phase is this is where our metabolism starts to speed up. Like I said, it was a little bit slower in follicular and ovulation, it starts to speed up a bit. So we have an increased energy need, meaning that we need about 200 and 250 more calories. Like how, how, you know, how many of you, how many of you feel more tired during your luteal phase. This is equivalent to our PMS phase. How many of you feel like you have no energy and you're moody all the time? This is very common because you're likely still eating the same and in that same caloric deficit and trying to eat the salads and chicken and do all of like, you know, the crazy hit workouts and whatever and just keep going, 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 living this life at, you know, 100 miles per hour, that's not going to keep up. Your body's not going to respond the same way at this point in your cycle. And because of our increased metabolism, we have a greater energy need. So we need more calories to keep up with our greater energy need. And it makes sense that our metabolism is increasing. It's, it makes sense. Our, our body is doing more things. Our body at this point is either prepping the uterine lining for a pregnancy or it's getting ready to drop the egg and actually have a period, right? So it's either fertilizing an egg that happened during ovulation or it's prepping for a period. So it's a lot is going on down there. So it makes sense that we need more energy, calories or energy for the body to fuel that 
process. So, and we also are craving more comfort foods during this time. So you should make soups and stews and have things that are more comforting to you. This is, as far as the seasons go, luteal phase is our fall equivalent. And think about logically the difference between summer and fall. You're not as social during this time. Like you're not traveling as much, you're turning inward. Maybe you're starting school or you're like, okay, like I kind of blew through my vacation days. I'm ready to dive back into work or you're kind of RSVPing no more. You're trying to spend more time alone. That's what you're craving during this time and you're craving, and as the weather is turning, it's getting a little bit colder, like you just want comfort during this time. So from a nutrition standpoint, you definitely want soups, stews, comfort foods, and there are a couple other foods that can support you during this time because a lot of people in PMS have, or they, they experience a lot of negative and adverse period symptoms like bloating and they start to break out. So um, headaches, fatigue, brain, brain fog. So we definitely want to have, you know, nutrition considerations that are supporting our body during this time. Sweet potatoes are absolutely incredible during this time. Sweet potatoes are like a vitamin A pill. And vitamin A is great because it breaks down that excess estrogen because we want estrogen to come down and a lot of our adverse period symptoms or when we have estrogen dominance and there's too much there, it hasn't decreased enough to let progesterone increase to actually have a period. And so we need to be having foods that help us break down that ex excess estrogen to prevent estrogen dominance, but we also need to be consuming foods that are going to support progesterone production. So sweet potatoes are really great for decreasing excess estrogen and chickpeas. Chickpeas are gonna be your new BFF. They are really, really great for increasing progesterone production. Other good things to have during this time are bone broth. Bone broth is great for electrolytes. It has calcium in it, it has magnesium. It's definitely going to, you know, help with, you know, it's definitely going to help with your hydration status. It's gonna help improve your sleep. It's gonna help with bloating and, you know, helping build strong bones. And if you have irregular periods or you have amenorrhea, which means that you haven't had a period, in 60 days, so two months. Like if you haven't had a period in two months, you are considered to have amenorrhea. And once you have amenorrhea, you know, you're just not producing enough estrogen to support your bone health. So your bones start to get really weak, which is not good because our bone health really sets in in our 20s and 30s. Like that's when we reach a peak of bone strength. And then it starts to decrease from there. So we need to be building as strong, as strong of bones as we can in our 20s and 30s because then it just only goes down from there. So this is really our, our period health is so important to make sure that later in our life, we're you know less of a fall risk and we're decreasing our risk for osteoporosis and osteopenia. So we definitely wanna have, you know, be doing everything that we can to make sure we're building strong bones now so that it can help us later down the line. So having calcium during this time will definitely help. A bone broth can help with that, as well as leafy greens. Greens have calcium in them as well as so many other vitamins and minerals. And leafy greens have indole-3-carbinol in them, which is really, really great for also breaking down estrogen. So it's great for luteal phase because we're trying to get estrogen to come down and we're trying to increase the production of progesterone. So chickpeas are gonna come in for that. So that combination is great. However, our body doesn't always respond well to raw vegetables during this time. So if you could, you know, throw some greens in a smoothie or put them in a stir fry or a soup or a stew, your body will respond better to that. Or roasting some green vegetables, your body will respond better to that during this phase. And then lastly, we get to a menstrual phase. It's about three to five days. Obviously, everyone's a little bit different depending on how regular your period is. But you know, on average for people, the bleeding should last about three to five days. And it's very similar to luteal phase in 
the sense that our metabolism is still increased because our body is literally shedding the uterine lining. So body's going through a lot. It has a greater energy need. So you still need about 200 to 250 more calories during this time. And you might be thinking to yourself, like, oh, that sounds like a lot. It's very easy to get 250 you know, more calories in. It, it really is. It's just like an extra, extra snack, like another rice cake with peanut butter on it. You know, it's, it's really, it's really not that, not that much. And again, we want to be, this is our winter equivalent. So you're naturally more of a recluse during this time and you want warm foods, you want comfort. So again, turn to soups, stews, anything that's comforting and what's normally comforting is normally more calorically dense. So I think that's why we crave that at this time as well. And things that are warm, like we want to stay away from raw vegetables during this time. We want stuff that's cooked, whether that's roasted or put in a stir fry, soup or stew. That's what we prefer. Seafood is really great during this time because it has omega-3 fatty acids in it. So those are antioxidants. It's going to help to decrease bloating. And it's also a great form of protein, so that's going to keep your blood sugar stable. And if your blood sugar is stable, that means that your mood is definitely more stable. You're not getting hangry. And grass-fed beef is great during this time or any sort of meat because as you're bleeding, you're losing blood, you're losing iron. So we need to replenish the iron. There's also iron in leafy greens as well. So you're kind of, you're, the leafy greens are the best of both worlds because you're getting the fiber, you're getting the indole 3 carbonyl for, you know, breaking down that excess estrogen, which is going to be helpful for you. And you're also getting iron and calcium too. So, uh, so many, so many great benefits to the leafy greens. So those are some, you know, nutrition considerations for each phase. But I also want to speak to cravings because I hear all the time, and you know, I definitely experience for myself too, that especially in luteal phase and menstrual phase, cravings can be so, so severe and literally take over us. Like I remember in high school, I would be like, like clockwork every single month going to McDonald's and getting a McFlurry and a, the medium fry and dipping the fries in the shake because I needed that salt, I needed the sugar, I wanted the carbs and I needed it now. So now I've managed my cravings and I know what to look for, I know what my body needs and I'm not racing off to McDonald's every single month because I am supporting my body nutritionally. It's not that I'm not allowing myself to have those treats because you know they're, <laughs> we definitely need a big flurry here and there, but I'm not necessarily doing that every single month because I have a nutrition system and foods looped into my routine that are supporting my hormones and I'm doing things to ward off these cravings. And you know, cravings aren't necessarily a bad thing. They are a clue into what your body is asking for. Our bodies are so, so smart. So if you are craving a lot of coffee during PMS, luteal phase, or on your period, that is a sign and a clue that you have a cortisol imbalance. Cortisol is our stress hormone. So you're likely very stressed out during this time. So I would say do some meditation, let's relax, journal it out, go to a yoga class, do things that will not stress you out. And from a uh, food standpoint, you know, maybe you can try and make some swaps. Can you have decaf coffee? Can you have at least one less cup of coffee? Could you choose water instead or have tea as something that's maybe not caffeinated? Can you make some swaps with time? I understand people are, you know, very sacred with their coffee and I totally understand but with time can we start to make some some swaps or could we double down on some stress management techniques to bring your stress hormone down during this time so you can better support your hormones just something to think about just want to plant the seed if you're craving a lot of chocolate during luteal phase or your period that is a sign of a magnesium deficiency which there's a lot of magnesium in bone broth so definitely yeah you know, maybe turn to the bone broth too there's magnesium in so many so many different foods um but also there's there's also magnesium in chocolate so let yourself have the chocolate especially if you get a dark chocolate that you know is definitely the most antioxidant friendly and most anti-inflammatory so if you get a good quality dark chocolate or some raw cacao they put that um in your coffee or in a smoothie that could be so good during this time and feed your need for more magnesium 
if you're craving salty foods or soda during your period, that's normally a sign of an electrolyte imbalance. It means you're probably not hydrated enough. So maybe drink some water, but pair that with a salty snack. So if you like water and pretzels, that's really good. Maybe you get one of those liquid IVs to put in your water to get some more electrolytes in, or maybe you have a cup of bone broth. That's great for electrolytes as well. Uh, maybe you put a little salt on your food and make sure that you're staying hydrated. It's definitely important that you're catering to that. And if you're craving soda, like you could still have a carbonated beverage, but could you just have a seltzer instead of a, you know, sugar sweetened beverage instead of soda? Just planting the seed. If you crave a lot of sugar and carbs during your period, could be a couple things. It could be that you have a vitamin B deficiency. So chickpeas are really great during this time because, um, you know, that is like filled with vitamin B. Sweet potatoes are also great during this time because they have vitamin A as well as vitamin B. So that can help with that. And so you might have a vitamin B deficiency, but you also might have unstable blood sugar. Your blood, you know, your blood glucose might be mismanaged. So when your blood sugar is mismanaged, it really messes with your your energy levels. Whenever we consume carbohydrates, it breaks down into glucose. That's its smallest form. And when glucose is in the bloodstream, I mean, that shoots up right away and you gain a lot of energy from that. It's a very, it's a quick source of energy for us. And then you get an insulin spike. Insulin is another hormone to grab the glucose from your bloodstream and take it out of the bloodstream. So it can bring that energy to other parts of the body. And it's really, you know, it can be dangerous if your blood sugar, if the blood levels in your sugar are high and they remain high for a long period of time this is diabetes and when you have problems with insulin and it can't grab the, the the sugar and the glucose out from your blood and it's just chilling out there that's diabetes as well like that that is a problem and leaving the sugar the glucose in your bloodstream can cause a lot of damage i mean that's why diabetics you know some of them end up having to get amputated or they have diabetic retinopathy and they start you know, it messes with their, the blood vessels around their eyes and it can affect their, their vision or diabetic cataracts. So it starts messing with their, their vision. They get numbness in their fingers and toes. So it's, you know, it really can, can be dangerous when you, when you, when your blood sugar is mismanaged over a long period of time. So it's important to not always have fast acting carbs carbs are definitely essential essential we need that that's our main energy source but we want to be doing two things we want to be having complex carbs that have fiber so that, that definitely is sweet potatoes that's quinoa that's wild rice so many different more complex carbs a whole wheat toast whole grain toast that's one and um we also want to be pairing our we also want to be pairing our um we also want to be pairing our carbs with a healthy fat source or a protein source because those don't shoot your blood sugar up so quickly. So it helps to stabilize things, to keep you satiated for longer, but it also helps to prevent that insulin spike and your blood sugar spiking up so high. So it's definitely better for your body and easier for your body to handle. Plus it's gonna keep you fuller longer. So it's gonna keep your blood sugar stable. And when your blood sugar is stable, your mood is more stable. So you wanna be focused on having a lot of protein, 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 and healthy fats with your carbohydrates and you wanna be focused on looping in some complex carbohydrates that are gonna give you longer lasting energy, and making sure that, that, that you have those balanced meals and that you're also not skipping meals, that you're eating regularly so that you're, you're not skipping breakfast, you're having three meals a day plus one to two snacks, you're eating every couple hours, and that you're meeting your body's need for 
having 200 to 250 more calories. So if you crave a lot of sugar and carbs during your period, definitely, you know, consider, consider those things and ask yourself like, okay, am I skipping meals? Am I eating regularly? And when I am eating, am I having a balanced meal where I have multiple macronutrients on my plate where it's carbs, fats, and protein? So I'm having a mixed meal. Am I doing that? And if you're not, that's a good place to start. If you crave a lot of meat or beef during your period, that's a sign of an iron deficiency. So have some meat or beef or have some iron rich, iron rich foods. And leafy greens is another example of an iron rich food. Um, if you crave a lot of salmon or fish during your period, this is totally normal as well. Seafood is so, so good for your period. And it's because of the anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acid quality about them. So that will keep you fuller longer. It's a great source of protein and those antioxidants will help decrease bloating and decrease inflammation in the body. If you crave fats like avocado and cheese and nut butters or nuts, these are healthy fats. They have antioxidant qualities. They are so, so good to have. So that will help anti with its anti-inflammatory benefits, help to decrease bloating and, you know, really help the body just flush things out. But the healthy fats have, they are the most, out of all macros and foods, they are the most calorically dense. So it's possible that if you're craving a lot of fats during your period or in luteal phase, like avocado and cheese and, and nuts and nut butters, things like that, you are also looking for more calories. Your body is asking for more nutrients and more energy. So it's, ask, it's craving more energy dense, calorie dense items. So just another thought there as well. So so there are a few places to start. Um, I hope that this was helpful for you and you know just a few nutrition considerations when it comes to different phases of your cycle. I think a really great place to start is just to start tracking your cycle and seeing where you are and what phase you might be in and starting to get in tune. That's what I love about aligning your life to your cycle. It gives you autonomy back and you're not just following a plan, but you're leading the plan and you're asking yourself, how do I feel this day? What's my mood? What am I craving? And you're not just listening to your body's cues, but you're responding to your body's cues in a way that in which you're trying to meet your body's needs. It really, it really is such an amazing concept and you'll feel more aligned, you'll feel more energized and your body will start to work properly and your cycle will start to be more regular, which is, which is incredible. So I hope this gives you a couple places to start. And if you need more support with this, definitely look to the show notes. We have my free guide that gives a fuller list of foods there. We have my free meal plan and prep guide that could be helpful for you if you're not in the habit of meal prepping and planning and grocery shopping and eating consistently like that, that is a really great place to start and if you already know that you need more personalized support with this which i think most people do definitely take my quiz and see which one of our health coaching programs could be for you because this is something that we work on with clients very directly and we customize with them and i get to know i really become an expert in their cycle nothing is taboo here my clients always message me when they have their period and we're adjusting things for them and talking about what foods could work for their cycle and kind of dissecting their cravings and their eating habits and it, it really is it's so great to be able to to do that with clients. Sometimes we just need that, you know, extra support and accountability to kind of go back and forth with someone to get the customized support. So if, and especially if you have PCOS, if you have PMDD, if you have endometriosis, or you, maybe you suspect you have these things, definitely take my quiz and see which one of our health coaching programs could be for you because you likely will need this individualized support, especially if you already know you have one of those conditions or if you suspect that you do. So thank you so much and I'll see y'all in the next episode.
Hey, y'all. Thanks again for listening to the Be About Being Better podcast. I so appreciate you. If this episode made you laugh, smile, think about yourself or your life differently, in any way making your life better, I empower you to share the show with three people who, just like you, need to hear this message and have this type of transformation in their lives. I personally read all the reviews of the show and see the Instagram story shares and honestly gives me so much joy to see that our mission is making people's lives better and the reviews really do help in increasing our impact so thank you so much for taking the time to do that if you need personalized support with anything discussed in today's episode or need help creating a sustainable diet-free lifestyle take my quiz it's linked below in the show notes and that quiz will help you see which one of our coaching programs is right for you thank you so much again for listening and here's to being about being better 